These strange looking vehicles are taking part in a race across Australia. It's a tough task for any vehicle, let alone one fueled by sunlight. There's no petrol, no pedals, just solar panels. The black areas on these cars are the solar panels and they absorb sunlight and turn it into electricity. Well out in the lead is Sun Racer, which at one stage averaged 47 miles per hour in the blazing desert sun. This entry from Switzerland was in second place until a crash forced it out. But it was Sun Racer, nicknamed by some as a flying cockroach because of its sleek shape, that went on to win the race. Well, I'm afraid you're not going to find one of those in your local car dealer. It wouldn't be much use in here in England. But here's a few things that do work well in hot, sunny countries. This is a solar-powered fridge. In fact, it's used to store vaccines and medicines in remote places like Africa, you see. And how it works is you can't plug it in. You just have a solar panel and that picks up the sun's rays, which drives the fridge. A very useful thing. Also, this is a solar torch. Sounds a bit daft, I know, but what happens is that the sun's rays hit this section here and the light comes out of this side here. But what's most important is that the uh, cells on, this, on the other side charge these batteries up and then at night time they're discharged and you get the light that you need. There we are. Now, to get enough electricity to drive some of these things, you need huge, great big solar panels and it's a bit impractical. So the device things like this which fold up, you see, there's a lot of area there, yet it falls into that very neat package. And this thing can be used to charge up batteries or drive larger appliances. Anyway, in this country, we don't use so much solar power for a pretty obvious reason, we haven't got that much sun. But we are used to gadgets like this, look at that. Little calculator, pretty little thing. That's the numbers there, and there, that's the solar cell picking up the power, which drives the calculator. Just next to it, that's a solar radio, a stereo radio, great reception. Once again, there's no batteries there. All the power comes from that solar cell on the front. This is a slightly bigger thing. This goes on the side of a greenhouse. It's a fan. How it works is that the sun hits this side, the solar panel generates a current and drives this fan. Can you see a fan in there? Let's put a bit of light on it. Get going. There it is. It's off. Marvellous. So the sun's doing all the work. It doesn't cost you anything on your electric bill. Now here's a little device which isn't terribly difficult to build, it's just very simple, it's a solar cell and a little toy motor, let's give it a spin, come on little thing, there we go, can you see that's a solar cell driving a little motor on the top, I love it because it's got absolutely no practical application whatsoever, however using the same pieces you can build a thing like this, we call it a solar windmill, that's your solar cell and it's got one thing in common with the fridge, the torch, everything you've seen, when you take away the light source, the electricity stops being generated and the device ceases to function. There it is. Now if you want to build one, you get the solar cell from any decent electronic shop and uh, you put a wire on the front and a wire in the back of this particular one and wire it into a little motor like that. And you see we've actually fixed the motor to the revolving part and the axle of the motor is clamped there and that's a pin from a 13 amp plug, rather ingenious. And that's how the whole thing works. Now, as I say, you get the solar cell from a decent electronic shop. The motors, look, there's four in a packet, they're all dead cheap. And so it doesn't really cost a great deal to build your solar windmill. Now, once you've built it, there's all different experiments you can try. For instance, try blocking off half the solar cell and then see how that varies the speed of the motor. Another thing you might want to try is use a different coloured light bulb. So this is going to be red light or green, whatever. You could even get a 40 watt bulb or a 60 watt bulb. See how that varies the speed. In fact, you might even think of a few experiments of your own. Now, if you can't get the different bits or you have trouble assembling the kit, you can get ready-made kits like this one we've got down here, solar energy kit. There it is, a solar cell, a motor, already wired up. And in fact, look, here's one. We've done nothing to it and it goes already. Pretty good, eh? This is a new sort of material. It's ordinary plastic, but it's coloured with a special dye that makes it reflect light in a very strange way. Have a look at this. Now, you can see that the edges of the squares and the ends of the tubes are much brighter than the faces of the squares. 
Now that's because of a phenomenon called total internal reflection, and what that means is explained by Joanna Lacey. Joanna, you've got a laser, haven't you? Yeah, here's the beam, and I'm showing up with this vapor. If you'll help me by picking up the prism, yeah. you can see that the laser light is going in one direction and coming out slightly bent. Yes, it's going in straight and it's coming out refracted, bending towards the ground. Right. Okay. If you turn it slightly towards your left... Yeah. Still going in in the same way, but it's bending more, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And now it's not coming out at all, but it's coming out below on the same side, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. Ah, so that's what's meant by total internal reflection. It's reflecting off the edges of that prism as though it were a mirror. Right, thank you very much then, Joanne. So, what sort of uses could they use this new material for? Well, it's still a bit in the experimental stage, but one thing they're trying is a clock like this. Now, the light shines on the clock face, and it goes out to the edges, where it falls on solar cells, the sort of thing that you could have perhaps in a calculator. And those solar cells are the things then that power the clock. And also, it charges up some standby batteries so that when the light goes out at night time, the clock still runs. <laughs> Windmills have existed for many centuries. For about 800 years, they were used mainly for pumping water and grinding grain. But since the energy crisis of the 1970s, things have changed. These experimental windmills have blades shaped like aeroplane wings, and they're used to generate electricity from the wind, hence the name wind turbines. Carmarthen Bay in Wales is the home of Britain's most modern windmills. Two basic designs are on trial here. One obvious difference between them is that the blades rotate in different directions. This one's a bit like the older windmills where the blades turn round the horizontal axis. In the other type, the blades rotate about the vertical tower. Simon Powells is in charge of this turbine. Well, this is a vertical axis design. You can see the way it rotates is quite different to the other machine on the site. This has one major advantage, and that is that you don't need to steer the machine into the wind. Whatever the wind direction, the, the machine will still make power from the wind. Another thing is that the blade stresses in the design are less. If we look at this model, well, these are the blades of the machine, and they're just like aeroplane wings. The force of the wind pushes these round, and these rotate the cross arm, and then the power is taken down the tower and into electrical generators at the base. Looking at that in the real thing, the revolving arm spins an axle that runs vertically down the column to the machine house at the bottom. Here, the vertical axis is changed by a system of gears to a horizontal one. This drives a shaft that runs through the walls to the generator room. This generator produces a constant supply of electricity. But how does it do that when the strength of the wind is always changing? In very light winds, the blades are upright like this, so we can make as much power as possible. And as the wind gets stronger and stronger, the whole thing folds up to reduce the electrical power output. Normally, this folding or reefing happens automatically as the wind gets stronger. So, reefing today will make it go slower because the wind is constant. Before reefing, the computer shows a fairly constant electrical power output. The blades start to fold slowly into an arrowhead shape. This reduces their grip on the wind and the machine begins to slow down. The complete reefing process takes about two or three minutes. The computer display now shows that the electricity produced is dropping as the cross arm slows down. The machine is now fully reefed with the blades in an arrowhead position. This is how the wind turbine would look in very strong winds. However, at constant wind speed, the electrical output has dropped sharply. 
This machine produces about 150 kilowatts, enough for 60 to 70 homes. All the electrical power that we make, we sell to the national grid and we get paid for it by the CGB. This machine is only a scale model of one four times the size of this, which we'd be hoping to put out at sea. Even so, we still need quite a few of these larger machines to be the equivalent of a modern power station. Windmills are a very old way of getting power out of moving air, but they're tricky things for two reasons. Firstly, quite often there's no wind at all, and secondly, when there is a wind, it keeps shifting direction. Well, there's not a lot you can do when there's no wind. But there is something you can do when the wind starts changing direction. Now have a look at this windmill. When I turn off the west wind there and turn on the north wind, all these fans over here. Right, there it goes. And you can see the windmills starting to gradually turn round in the direction of the new north wind. There she goes. Now the question is this. How is it that the windmill knows it's finally pointing in the right direction? Before you build a large full-scale windmill, it's a sensible idea to make a few models and see which designs work out to be the best ones. Now here we've got a whole lot of different models made out of plastic lemonade bottles of all things. They've all been built by Les Campbell. Now Les, how do you go about comparing your different designs? Well, this first pair of windmills here, the only thing that's different between them is the angle of the blades, the yeah. angle that the blades are set at here. And <coughs> I use this little device here, which is just a, a protractor really cut out of a piece of cardboard, to measure the angles of the blade. You put it in place, pull the straw around until it touches both sides of the blade, yeah. and then when you lift it out, you can read off the angle of the blade directly from the and side. You've got of the, the degrees all carefully marked out. On That's there. right, yeah. So those That's ones are set at about 50 degrees. Because you can see that that one's going round a great deal faster than that one is. That's yeah. right, yeah. So that's one way of working out which bit of design's better, isn't uh -huh. it? If we just get rid of these two for a second, though, what's the difference between those two uh, lemonade bottles going down? <coughs> well, the only difference is the number of blades in this one. Yeah. To see if the number of blades makes a difference to the speed that they go round at. This one here has got six blades, and the one here has got 12 blades. Yeah. And if I release them from a stationary position... See, that one picks see up much faster right, to start yeah. with, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Everything's the same apart from the number of blades in that one. Those ones there. Right. Now we've got some rather more <coughs> unusual looking ones sticking out here. What are these all about, Les? <coughs> well, this is really an idea to try and use some of the designs in nature mm -hmm. to see whether, for instance, the shape of a, the fin of a fish, which is curved at the front and curved at the back, to see whether that would have an effect on the, the speed at which the bottles went round. And this one here is shaped just like that. Yeah. Um, this one here, which is, again, a sort of a crescent moon shape, curved at the front and curved at the back, but I've also let lent them over so they're actually curved round mm -hmm. rather than being straight up. What's the last one? The last one here was an attempt to actually change the shape of the blade itself and mm -hmm. turn it into an aerofoil shape, like the shape of an aeroplane's wing. And I've, I've achieved that by simply folding the plastic back round over itself and then fixing it together with a piece, a piece of sellotape. Um, this design here, as you can see, hasn't actually achieved much. It doesn't work very well. No, but no. it's a different design. It's yeah. fair to try them all. We can learn yeah. from our mistakes as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Right, supposing I want to make a plastic lemonade bottle windmill, how do I go about doing it? Well, the first thing you need, of course, is a, a plastic lemonade bottle, right. which you have to remove the label from. And if it's got one of those caps on the top, you can mm -hmm. remove that. The best way to do it, really, is to, to warm it up with very hot water. And then you can remove any excess glue that's on there with some white spirit, and that will yep. leave it in a state where you can actually start to make the bottle. This is one which has had the label removed, and the next thing to do here is to decide to mark out the blades. And the way I've done this is to use a piece of masking tape, and I've marked it with the number of blades that I want so to put So you've got five it. blades on that one? Five That's blades, right, yeah. you have five blades there. Now you fix this first of all at the top of the bottle, wrap it round at the top, and then fasten it with another piece of tape at the other end, like that. And then you can simply 
take a, mar a, a marking pen and mark the positions, top and bottom, of the mark. The marking so you, you put two little dots, one on either side of your marking tape, yeah? Yeah, that's right, one at the top. And once you've done it all round at the top there, yeah. you do it round at the bottom there. Right. And that, you end up with a bottle which is marked out top and bottom. You can then, using a pair of compasses, you can push through the plastic, through the marks, and this makes it much easier when you come to drill them a bit later. The drill doesn't spin right. all over the place on there. Having prepared it and marked the holes, as I said, you drill them with the drill, and then taking a, a rule or a, some straight edge, or if you're making a, a wing shaped blade, you'll have to use your own template or cutout. You can again mark the position of the bottle using a, a pen and mm -hmm. then mark top and bottom like that. Yeah, you can see a pattern starting to emerge here. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And where you, the, the marks on there is where you're going to cut. And simply taking a pair of scissors, you can push the pointed end into the hole that you've drilled yeah. and then just cut. It's, it's quite easy to cut, and it's worthwhile taking, taking your time over it, because the smoother the edge that you get, the better it seems to perform. Jagged edges seem to upset yeah. the air going across. Having done that, you can then push the blades in. Yeah, I was going to say, here's, here's one that you've already done. It's got That's a right, few yeah. more blades than that. Uh -huh. it's, uh, and when, you, when you put it on the retort stand, I see you've got a bit of plasticine and a drawing pin. Yeah. What's that about? <coughs> well, that's the, the bearing at the top. It, it, it lasts for quite a long time. And it fits into a little hole which you can make inside here. You can sh stick a bradle or a something, bradle like, or something that, yeah. like that in and make a hole in the middle of it at the top there. And then that fits nicely onto the drawing pin. And like it just that. lets it spin much and better, it, doesn't it? It just yeah. spins around. The, the final thing that you can do there, of course, is this is chattering around at the bottom here. It and loses energy, doesn't it, when yep. it does that one? Oops, That's right. Off the top. So what do you do then? Well, here, you just take the bottle top that you've taken off the top there, yeah. and then depending on the size of the stand that you're going to put it on, mm -hmm. you make a hole in the bottom here, and then just fasten it on to the bottom of the bottle in a normal way, right, right. and that will stop it from moving about and makes it run much smoother. Oh, right. Now, once you've got your windmill set up, I mean, some of them spin around pretty quickly, it must be quite <coughs> hard to count the revolution, so yeah. how can you compare the speeds that, say, two different windmills are going at? Well, when you want to actually measure them, one easy way of doing it is to take a length of cotton. I've mm -hmm. just wound a length of cotton onto a cotton reel here. This is about a metre long. Yeah. If I was doing it, I'd actually use a longer length of cotton because it would make the result more accurate. And you just use a stop clock to time how long it takes to pull the length of cotton off. And there it goes, yeah. And there it goes, yeah. So you time that, and then using exactly the same length of cotton, you try it on your other bottle and see which one's faster. That's right, yeah. So obviously the faster one is moving more efficiently and so forth. Yeah. But speed is not the most important consideration, though, is it? No. You've got to work out when you're getting the most energy out of the, out of the windmill. Yeah. In other words, when it's developing the most power. And one way of doing that is to work out how, much, how long it takes to lift a load up through a distance. So right. you need to measure the distance, measure the weight of the load and mm. time how long it takes to pull it up. Mm. In fact, if you blow on that now, it'll come up, won't it? Yeah. yeah. Here's something that you might like to try. Blow on the side of the windmill that's going to turn this round, the one that normally so, goes away from Yeah, the side that goes away from yeah. Well, it's this side, here we go. Yeah, so? Nothing surprising about no, that. Not now really. blow on the other side, the side that... The yeah. side that would come towards yeah. me, right. <laughs> that's weird. That defies the laws of physics. Thank <laughs> you.